All right. Well, good morning to all. Yeah, we're going to cover the science aspect here to the December 15th, 16th storm. And as Bruce was mentioning, it was a, a, a big, uh, big impact across almost the entire central region. Uh, I've shown here a kind of hand-drawn graphic of all the various uh, hazards. Yeah, you could fine-tune this a little bit more, but in general, you know, anywhere from the Mountain snows and squalls out in Wyoming, Colorado. Some of those squalls even extended into Nebraska and South Dakota. Then you had a wide swath of high winds, um, a corridor of very high winds there across Colorado and Kansas into Nebraska at, and combined with dry fuels uh, led to a lot of blowing dust and fires. And then in the warm sector, you had a, uh, an area of severe thunderstorms and tornadoes um, into regions that don't usually experience severe weather in the month of December. So I'm just going to jump to the science uh, and science aspect of this. So, <clears throat> you know, leading up to this event, I had done some science sharing presentations. In fact, we did a live one. And um, in those presentations, if you look going way back to like December 10th, which was another big high impact day with the long track tornado going through Kentucky, if you looked at cluster analysis, um, there was really good agreement amongst all the ensembles of a very deep anomalous trough heading into the western U.S. and a big strong ridge uh, over the most of the central and eastern regions and southern region for that matter. Um, and so, you know, you're, you see a pattern like this and it's already telling you there's going to be something <laughs> significant on the horizon. And this was leaded up, up to December 15th. You know, given such a amplified trough ridge pattern, you'd obviously expect to see um, various different parameters also experience the same anomalies. And, you know, the European Extreme Forecast Index is something I, I generally like to look at because it, it really puts things in climatological context. Um, and, you know, you see, you know, a lot, a lot of the ensemble uh, guidance suggesting, um, you know, high levels here of, you know, EFI as well as shift of tails um, in the max temperature department. You see it too in the wind gust department and in that wide swath that we um, saw. And this only goes up to zero Z on the 16th. You know, there's still continued high winds after that. And then <clears throat> included in the Cape Shear diagnoses, um, which is very anomalous again for December, this time in December, but hey, it's a really anomalous uh, upper pattern. So, you're, you know, this is not. Um, not to be not expected, if that's a, a way to describe it. So again, the EFI and shift of tails was quite high, and you, you know, MBM version 4.1 has had a lot of specific wind and wind gust improvements applied to it, and so we can kind of see, you know, the MBM also showing some of these high um, high wind probabilities. These are for gusts greater than or equal to 48 knots, so it's almost basically high wind warning criteria, and you can see the very wide swath of it. Um, and this is for 60 on the 15th, 60 on the 16th. And again, those continued off or up into the Great Lakes region on the 16th. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, as I was mentioning, the, there was some really dry fuels, and uh, what's really cool, so there's this, um, land information system provided by NASA that does some soil moisture diagnoses. And across Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas, you can see the four inch, the four inch soil moisture was very, very low. Uh, and it's been reflective of the, um, some of the drought conditions in place uh, as well. And so you're just, you're just right for it to combine those winds and the, uh, the winds and wa very warm temperatures and, and low moisture, just basically set yourself up for it favorable situation for fires as well as blowing dust. You know, as far as what happened, negatively tilted trough lifted up into the upper Midwest, seen here by the NACE anomaly, NACE standardized anomaly, anomalies of almost down to minus two or so, um, very abnormal. You go to the wind speed plots, they also show, you know, way outside of climatology when you look at the re re return intervals and, uh, for especially this time of year in, Dece you know, in, in December, especially at 700, 800, 850 millibars. Moisture fields, you know, you strong moisture transport, basically very indicative of an atmospheric river. It's, it, and that's intensifying with time as that trough lifts up towards the upper Midwest, you know, to propel moisture northward. And in fact, some the 
the moisture, uh, the personal waters ended up uh, exceeding the record values at um, Green Bay and Davenport per the SPC Sun and Climatology page. And one final item here to wrap up, um, you know, as mentioned about the science sharing presentation, a few of the presentations last. The last time mentioned about a sting jet with this, that's also included within the science sharing um, presentation where you had, you know, such a dynamic negatively tilted trough that it, you got a very um, tight corridor of winds in the, associated with the comma head. Uh, so, you know, take a look at that when you have your some free time. And I will send here right now a link to this story map um, on the chat. With that, are there any questions on the science side? Feel free to raise your hand if you'd like, or otherwise we will jump to our, our various offices. Yeah, next up we've got uh, the Wichita office, uh, Chris Jacob, Brad Ketchum, and Roger Martin, uh, kind of a uh, kind of a tag team effort here. And uh, we're just gonna kind of play it by ear. If folks have a question or two immediately following each section, we wanna do that uh, while questions and the material is fresh in your mind. If we run behind schedule wise, we'll save uh, questions until the end. So think of any questions you may have and we'll provide that opportunity between each office. So Wichita is up. All right, good morning, everyone. Can you guys uh, see the screen okay there? Yes, we can. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning to all the offices in the uh, central region. I'm uh, Chris Jacob. Uh, Brad was having some uh, technical issues, so it'll just be myself and uh, Roger Martin III uh, doing this presentation. So what happened on December 15th uh, for our area, it was really unimaginable. It, we knew it was going to be a high impact event. Uh, we did have a uh, mega fire in central Kansas. And if you look at the satellite imagery, this was a pass from the polar orbiting satellite that came across about 10 hours later. That fire was still ongoing into the middle of the night. It was uh, one of the bigger fires we've ever seen in the state of Kansas. And Roger, will cover that a little bit more in detail. It was definitely uh, hitting our fire indexes. They were uh, pegged out the GFDI and the RFTI. So it definitely was a high end event for fire and wind across our area. And also we experienced a, a lot of blowing dust and some significant structure damage with the winds from this entire event. So we're not gonna, Andy covered the science. We're just gonna, I'm not gonna do a deep dive. I'm, the approach we're going to take here is the science. We had two high wind events this year, uh, October 28th. We actually looked at that, looked at the EFIs and compared it to what we were facing for the December 15th. And this was a, a really good uh, messaging barometer for impacts being ramped up and how to be strategic with our staffing for this particular event, knowing that this was going to be a higher end deal for us. The high wind event comparison, just kind of looking at a satellite image and just looking at the high wind gusts from the two events. And on the October 28th, we had 26 LSR reports, but you compare that to the 15th, we had 103. So it was almost like four times the amount of reports, uh, the banners that we had going up, banner alerts on AWIPS. We were getting those about every two minutes for every high wind hitting alert hitting our ASOS as the winds were just sustained above uh, high wind warning criteria. And another thing here to mention is this got us to think, you know, okay, we had two big events. We can kind of pre-build some of these uh, templates that we can uh, just pull from if we're expecting another high wind event. And is this gonna be just a medium high end event or is this gonna be extreme high end event? So the benefits of mesoanalysis that day, AWIPS procedures, if folks are familiar with the alpha feature, I think that's one of the best features we have in AWIPS because it allows you to be creative with your situational awareness and it highlights targets of opportunity. And this is a procedure that we were using that day and it sparked the generation of this chat message 
on NWS chat that we sent out for uh, Russell and Barton counties to kind of create that awareness. So I'm gonna wrap things up here. Uh, what science to impacts did we learn from this historic event to make us all better is conceptual models. Uh, these are conceptual models. The top one is a, uh, this comes from the folks at the Southern Great Plains Fire Out Outbreak Group. They developed this fire outbreak conceptual model. And then we also have the Stingjet conceptual model. We'll be adding this to our Google sites for our folks to, for our forecasters to utilize. And the thing that as a forecaster, there's what we really like about conceptual models. It's a great validation tool for ramping up your impact messaging and also starting to think about staffing if things start to match up with some of these conceptual models. And I'll end on this. Uh, one of the main things that we learned as this event was unfolding was the impact of those destructive winds, knocking down numerous power lines, which sparked grass fires. Never done this before. It was something we just thought of on the fly and we issued this uh, meso update emergency. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Roger now. Actually, I think Bruce was able to figure out something with uh, Brad. So I think Brad will be able to chime in. Is that correct? Uh, I'm here. If you can hear me, Roger. Yep. Okay, yep. Good, Brad. Go ahead. Good. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate it. Uh, so during the event, we did have some unique messaging opportunities. Uh, during early in the event, uh, we had the opportunity to actually issue um, some social media into our partners that highlighted kind of a heads up of the blowing dust that was headed our way uh, from our friends from Dodge City and Goodland. Uh, the messaging, we have these templates set up kind of a ready, set, go. Uh, so we kind of use that same philosophy for this that we do for the watches and warnings. So we kind of give a get ready because here it comes. So this was one of the first ones we did. The yellow highlights the area that we're looking at. Also, as the afternoon unfolded, uh, we issued numerous hotspots uh, as we went along. Uh, we issued actually 12 different hotspots as the sting jet came in and started knocking down the power lines. We did have, one of the things we did have issues with was uh, there is a Verizon issue that we're finding out that uh, when we send out our hotspots, they're not getting to our partners correctly. Uh, and that is one of our action items that we are looking at. Uh, and I know that uh, Central Region has been involved in this and our uh, WCM on uh, getting this Verizon issues taken care of. Supposedly, it's some spam filter that they're trying to fix to make sure all of our partners get these in a timely manner. So <clears throat> one of the things we did later on in the event was we had the large four counties fire and we used uh, our social media and messaging to highlight the areas to get people to respond. Uh, this is some of the yellow text we use to tell people with the satellite images, to tell people there was a large grass fire that was ongoing and that it was spreading eastward and that they needed to take uh, immediate action if they could. One of the things we did uh, during that fire, besides send out this graphic, was send out a fire warning. Uh, the fire warning was, um, it was an unprecedented opportunity that we had uh, that we had in our toolbox. Uh, one of our forecasters knew we could issue a fire warning. Uh, so we called uh, the local emergency manager up there and made them aware that we had this capability. And basically they said to us, do it, do it now. Uh, so we issued the first one at 424 and we issued another one at 734. Uh, the one thing that we noticed though, is that this is not we alerted and we were wondering about that. And we found out uh, later on that the only people that can we alert these are uh, about 12 people in the state of Kansas or certain emergency managers. Uh, but we, this was from an actual screen grab from somebody who had this image of the actual fire warning. Uh, we think uh, this, this helped during the event to get people to take action and actually move away. So one of the things that we do uh, during our office that we have for situational awareness is our video board. I don't know if a lot of you offices have seen this, but it is a communication tool and a situational awareness. We did it rather inexpensively uh, to have this video board put together uh, so we can have this SA board, all of our workstations face this board. And so we have it to be able to show people in the office what is going on in a timely fashion.
Go ahead, Roger. Hey, okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, uh, Brad and Chris. So real quick, um, because it, it, it garnered a lot of attention, I was just going to run through uh, the four county fire. So this is kind of going back to the, the what happened. Um, this this was uh, just just from a Kansas perspective and really for this area, pr pretty remarkable fire. Um, so so we did uh, we used Sentinel satellite imagery for uh, which, uh, you know, is used a lot for uh, tornado damage surveys. Um, but for those who haven't used it for fire weather, for burn scars and so on, it's, it's a great tool as well. There's some really neat color curves in there that can really help stand stand that out. So um, anyways, so we, we uh, put this together. So this is looking at the Fort County fire um, there between Russell and Paradise. So Russell is kind of the main uh, city in, in that county, but stretched, you know, basically from west to east about 32 miles. Uh, you know, it was in the top 0.03% of wildland fires for this area. Uh, it was larger than the size of Wichita, and I'll show that in a minute. And um, going back to the uh, uh, the group, the, that Southern Great Plains group that, that Chris had mentioned, it was the uh, uh, largest mega fire or the, the biggest mega fire since the Rhea fire in Oklahoma back in 2018. Um, so here's a look, uh, just the, it's, it's a little hard to see, I know, but the if you look, you can kind of see the, the interstate outline there of, of Wichita. So just to put it in perspective, how, how large this fire was, uh, it was larger than the city city limits of, of Wichita. So the, the fire itself is around 200 square miles. And uh, then, the, of course, the Wichita city, city limits, uh, a little over 160. So pretty impressive. Um, there, you can go to the next slide, Chris. These are just a couple of a couple of images, kind of the I think the bottom one Chris had shown his the one in the top right to me just kind of kind of an apocalyptic kind of look because you just imagine you know imagine a hundred mile an hour winds fueling a fire kind of like what we saw in Boulder's area um, a couple months ago as well just just a, a, you know amazing how fast that that damage can happen and and how much damage it can it can do in such a short amount of time so um, and one of the unique things um, <clears throat> that happened in this event too because we had the blowing dust um, you know imagine there's this large fire coming towards you and you don't and you don't always talking to some of the resident residents up there they didn't know that that large fire was coming in in some cases because it was being obscured by the dust so just a really interesting uh combination there and kind of a perfect storm if you will of, of fire uh, and then i think uh, one more slide there chris yep so then then just to kind of tie tie things off for our office kind of you know what could we do better what could we improve you know, uh, Brad mentioned the Verizon issue, and that's something that's already being worked on. Um, there were some issues with, uh, you know, this is a unique event because you had so many headlines. Um, so maybe a, a kind of a key takeaway there, you know, for operational is is trying to, you know, we're, we're the weather service at large is trying to simplify hazards. So that's something that um, it can be important. You know, do you, do you take the, the dust advisories and put it in with the high wind warning, things like that? That's one of the things that we've been kind of discussing locally here how to best handle that. Um, also, for those who don't know, there is a PDS option whenever you do a red flag warning. Um, you might have to set it up a certain way in, in your GFE, but when we do our product format or launcher, there's actually, a, a in the GUI there, there's a, a section where you can actually click PDS. So just that was something we didn't use for this event because not all, all of us realized that we had that option because we it's, a, it's so rare. Um, but that that is an option where you can use PDS wording either manually or or have it set up ahead of time. Um, and then staffing, the, the the one note there is so we did have a lot of bodies for for staffing. We actually could have used more. That was something I think that came up in last week's uh, guest speaker series. A lot of offices had mentioned that. And one of the things that we really um, we we could have done better is to have a, a warning coordinator or just a general coordinator because well, there's so many facets to this event. And just it can be very easily either for for duty overlap or just kind of managing you know who's doing what. So th those are kind of the kind of the three main takeaways for us. Um, and with that, I will uh, toss it back to Central Region. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks to, to all of you from Wichita for presenting. Any any questions for Wichita? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it it's great stuff that you presented there. You know, and I know that your area was just yeah, devastated with all the fire activity on top of um, you know going through all that wind action and very you know 
extreme high impact event. Sometimes like co correlate fires and severe weather almost one and the same, you know. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to move on to Sioux Falls. All right. And we are going to make Peter here to be the presenter. And so, should be on to you there, Peter. All right. Thanks, Andy. Can you see the screen? I cannot see a screen right now. Oh, there we go. Yep. Good. Okay. All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, Bill and I are going to tag team this a little bit. So we had a series of forecasters involved in our after action review, and their names are listed there. So I just want to thank them all for the work they've done in putting the information together for this presentation. But uh, for our area, we experienced a myriad of threats. Uh, the severe threat, the tornadic threat, was primarily in the southeastern corner of our forecast area. So we only had 10 documented tornadoes, which is just a fraction of the overall number of tornadoes, two of those were in EF2. We also had very strong synoptic uh, high winds as well as some winter weather considerations as well. So the way we wanted to go through this is just share with you some of our best practices and lessons learned in three different areas, messaging, warning operations, and the post-event process. So I'm just gonna go through those here quickly. On the messaging side, one of the best practices is that we developed a collective messaging ideas Google document that was shared throughout the entire staff. And this was the day before and then leading into the days after the event. And it really helped the forecasters to be able to message the various threats that we had to know what had been put out, what still needed to be done, and to make sure that the forecast resources and safety graphics were communicated throughout the event. So this was just a really nice way of keeping all that uh, together so that uh, we had a good plan moving forward. Uh, we've already talked about this a little bit, but this was certainly a historic and unprecedented event. Uh, for our area, we had never before had a documented tornado in the month of December, let alone issuing tornado warnings. And so leading into the events, we used some of the information provided within the Iowa Environmental Mesonet uh, folks and the graphics that they had available to talk about the unprecedented nature. And then when we did our actual webinar leading up to the event, we used words like historic and unprecedented just to highlight the fact that this is not just a normal storm and we are looking at the potential for tornadoes in the month of December. One of the other things, again, going back to the idea of having multiple threats for our area from winter to high winds to the severe threat, is instead of trying to come up with a graphic that hit on all those different things, we are creating separate graphics for each of those individual threats. So here's an example of one of the Twitter posts we had and each of those images down there in the bottom right hand corner are highlighting of various threats. So we have the severe threat there in the upper left, talking about the overall system in the upper right, then we have a snow graphic as well as the high winds. And so we we're hoping in doing that people could take and pick what they needed based on the area that they live in and then share those accordingly. One thing that really helped us out a lot was that SPC sent out an AWIPS chat at 1719Z leading into the severe component of this event, um, letting us know that they were going to be issuing an MD, uh, MD by 19Z and then the tornado watch by 20Z. And so that advanced notice really helped us to, to be on top of things and be able to create graphics and get the information out as quickly as possible once those products were actually issued. So uh, very, very much appreciated from the standpoint of the collaboration with SPC. One of the lessons that we learned from the messaging standpoint though, was with regards to social media, we had, we, we have several groups that we will monitor throughout a severe weather event that post pictures and reports and all sorts of things. And just because of the nature of this event, how extreme it was and how quickly it moved through, the, the ability to send out posts and also monitor became a little too much for one person. So moving forward, especially for an event of this magnitude, it would be a good idea to try to have at least two forecasters on social media. One of those people being able to post information, one of them being able to monitor and collect reports. And then something we didn't do, but something that might have uh, helped out is to be able to activate the, the savvy uh, program. And obviously that just wouldn't have been for our office, but for multiple offices. So just something to think about there on the social media side. I'm going to uh, pass it over to Phil and he's gonna talk about our warning operations. Thanks, Peter. Um, yep, this, uh, this is Phil Schumacher. I'm the, the Sioux here in Sioux Falls. So just a few things on, on warning operations. Uh, one thing that we 
have done for a few years now is we have a staffing availability planner. So everyone kind of puts in their shifts and also when they're free uh, outside of their shifts so we can plan ahead. Well, for this event, we took it one step further and we put that, that planner on Monday on the 13th. And then on Tuesday, the, the lead forecaster along with a couple other people put out basically the staffing plan for the day on Wednesday, like who was on ops, who are all the extra people coming in, even got down to the point of who was going to cover different aspects of warning operations, such as two, two people on radar and mesal analysts. And that allowed us to be able to have our operations all set to go, even a couple hours before things went in. And then we only had to make minor tweaks to that, this operations plan as storms moved in from the Omaha area into our area during the late afternoon and evening. And by making it available on our situational awareness display, all the forecasters on all shifts were well aware of what our plan was as we moved into warning operations on Wednesday. Next slide. So another thing we did, um, and this was based on actually an after action review that we did on August, from August 17, 2019, is instead of um, splitting our area by uh, ge geographically, we actually split our uh, our warrant radar meteorologist by warning type. Um, we went with severe thunderstorm warning, person who issued severes, and a person who issued tours. And this had a few advantages, um, which we saw in the past as well, including the tornadoes we had on September 10th of, of 2019 in Sioux Falls, is that the severe warnings tend to be very long and larger, usually 45. In this case, they were 60 minutes on, in general and were issued well ahead of the line. Um, and then that person, well, also issuing SVSs, was also then available to examine the radar and, and be almost like, a, in this case, a third pair of eyes. We had two people issuing tornado warnings um, and help to identify um, various possible tornadic threats on, along that line and gave us essentially three people who were um, very much looking at the at the radar, trying to identify tornadic threats across the area. Um, in addition, because this person, because our warning operations had a severe person, as tornado threats were, or mesocyclones or Boeing segments were identified, they would rapidly update from our baseline, which for this event was 70 and tour possible, given the dynamics, to 80 and tour possible, which led to WIA activations uh, on these systems. And as a result, um, our severe thunderstorm warnings you know, given this type of event, we're, we're, stats were very good. But more importantly, um, we, while we had three missed tornadoes, each one of those tornadoes were within a severe thunderstorm warning that had a wind tag of 80 and tor possible. And so even though there may not have been a tornado for all 10 of our tornadoes, um, we still was alerted because we had either updated through an SVS or initially issued a 80 per, mile per hour wind, uh, wind tag for the, that storm within that area. So People were being wheel alerted about, about the significant risks to these storms through the whole time. The next slide. And one lesson we learned was the fast nature of these, these storms made it much more difficult on polygons. Um, they were moving generally 60 to 75 miles an hour. And what, what happened is that we would draw up the polygon based on an older older quote unquote image. We were in sales three, so that we were getting Im images about every two minutes. Um, so we would draw up a polygon as in this case, based on the 2013, 2313 example. And then when we issued it somewhere around 2014 or 2015, the storms would have moved another two or three miles ahead of, of where they were when we made that polygon. The result was, and you can see that in this image here, is that the circulations, these are for tornado warnings, were a good five to seven miles ahead of the back edge of the line instead of being within two or three miles. And, and so one thing we want to work on training on, maybe this goes beyond just our office, um, is to develop some sort of training to have people work on drawing polygons for very fast moving storms, storms that are moving 50 plus miles an hour, where, where they can move a mile or two in that time that you're preparing the warning and updating the text, et cetera. And that includes also for SVSs and trying to minimize areas where that threat has already ended um, behind the storms. I'll turn it back over to you, Peter. All right, thanks, Phil. I know we're short on time, so I'll get through this quick here, but talking about some of our post-event operations, uh, normally we would use the MRMS low-level azimuthal shear to kind of take a look at where the best tornado paths might have been, but it was very messy with this event. 
And so something that really worked well is we tried to use the opportunity to create a, a PowerPoint graphic here in this case, showing where the primary mesos were and overlaid the up, uh, excuse me, the reported damage <clears throat> reports, excuse me, on top of those to share this with emergency managers, to get information from them, as well as our damage survey teams. And this really helped to kind of narrow down the areas that we needed to be focused on. As a follow-up to this, we, we'd really be interested to, to do it in a more easily conducted way, uh, whether or not through PowerPoint or some other way, because it, it did take a little bit of time to put this together. <clears throat> from a storm summary page, we had some comments that people really liked the clean and cohesive look uh with the graphics that were put together and so we're really hoping to be able to use this and move forward to create common templates and instructions on how to create this clean look so that all of our forecasters know in the future how to put things like this together uh, we did get a lot of help from our county emergency managers uh, taking pictures giving us reports sending us information one thing we're going to try to do still this spring is to meet up with a lot of those emergency managers and provide a little bit of training on what to look for, what kind of pictures uh, they can take, and, and some of the things that we might look at in a little more detail that they could help us with if we're not able to get out to these sites right away. Uh, probably this stands for pretty much everybody on the call, but we found that the DAT, both in the app and the desktop application, were, were pretty slow, uh, sometimes unresponsive. Uh, immediately after this event. And so one of the things, and I've already passed this along to the ROC region, but to encourage the exploration of maybe trying to host the data on, on a system that could better handle the input from multiple offices uh, at the same time. Because not only was it this event, but obviously there's still things going on from the previous week out in Kentucky. Uh, we found that, you know, with the very fast forward motion of these storms that a lot of the damage paths that we were looking at lacked obvious conversion patterns or some of those things we would look at in a true super, super cellular nature. Um, and then the fact that this was December and there was no crop made it really difficult to determine paths between damage points. And sometimes those damage points were uh, several miles apart. <clears throat> and so one thing that uh, we would like to see if possible is training to help better identify straight line wind damage from tornadic damage in these really fast moving QLCS, QLCS type cases, especially in the rural areas where we already have a general lack of damage indicators. Uh, and then the last thing here is that you know, we have several new forecasters. We brought on five new people since the pandemic started. So that can, can bind with COVID operations and the overall lack of high impact events over the past few years that required surveys. Um, we have several people that just don't have a lot of experience in these types of situations. And so one thing we have tried to do is we're building off of the video series that was done last spring by Central Region for damage surveys to try to come up with some hands-on exercises for people to become more familiar with the DAT and also the DAT application and then storm surveys in general. But we'd be really curious to hear from other offices to hear what they're doing in instances where they might not be able to get out in the field as often and trying to uh, still keep people on top of working these post events. That's it for us. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Bill. Any questions for, for Sioux Falls office? I would just throw out there, this is Bruce, that I, I, I really uh, I really like the, the proactive approaches that really both offices have discussed with regard to both staffing and, and getting ahead of the messaging part of this. Uh, you know, a lot of our talks are science focused, but increasingly we're talking about those other important dynamics like staffing and, and the messaging uh, in addition to the science. So uh, really great points for sure. Did get one question in here um, or maybe a comment. So Brett Borchardt said, just a quick note, we've had success creating preliminary tornado track maps in the DAT using radar data from GR2, which has GIS information. So it's also time consuming. <laughs> so. Yeah, similar challenge. I did want to bring up one, one other point. You know, you mentioned about you know having the and on the slide, you know, the lack of high impact events. I do know that that you know for some of our region um, it, during the pandemic here, it's been a little. It, it has been quiet. <laughs> so and there has been a lot of new bodies brought on across the you know across the region. So um, that's that's a very interesting point you got on here. So, all right, 
Well, nothing else heard. I am going to change our presenter. We're going to go to Des Moines, and Rod Donovan there is going to present for them. So, presenter, coming your way. Andy, this is actually Alex to start. Rod's going to go second for us. Oh, okay. All right. Um, that might be. And then should be seeing my title slide. There you, there you go. All right, excellent. All right, thanks, Andy. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, so this, uh, in addition to the fact that a derecho occurred in the month of December uh, in the continental United States, uh, this was an unprecedented event in terms of tornadoes for any season uh, here in the state of Iowa. It was the highest number of tornadoes that we've ever had in one day with 63 and also set a monthly record in one day. This broke our record of May 2004, which I believe was 57 tornadoes. In addition to all those tornadoes, it was also the most number of EF2 tornadoes that we've ever had with any single tornado outbreak event here in the state of Iowa. In addition to all of the severe convection that we had, we also had anomalously warm temperatures. We set our all time high temperature December record of 75 degrees in Southeast Iowa. And the background winds ahead of the main line and even behind it were really strong. Uh, we had a 74 mile per hour non thunderstorm wind gust that occurred at the Des Moines airport, uh, which is just on the so southern portion of the uh, Des Moines metro. So in my part of the presentation, I want to focus on some of the interesting aspects that we had with the mesovortex generation along this QLCS line. And so the first thing we'll take a look at is the shear environment with it. And we had plenty of it. We were in excess of 70 knots for our 0 to 3 kilometer bulk shear, which meant that if we're looking to apply a 30, line, a 30 knot line normal shear vector, we only needed a 25 degree orientation to achieve this. The shear vector on this day was from the southwest, which meant that any time that the line was oriented from northwest to southeast, uh, we were going to fully realize that 70 knots of line normal shear. And this actually happened, and that's important to note because when this happened is when we had the most robust mesovortex generation and was also part of the line that was most prolific with EF2 tornadoes as it came through central Iowa. We had plenty of low level vorticity ahead of this storm as well. Several where uh, rare inflow notches were present along the line. And initially, as this entered west central Iowa, our updraft downdraft convergence zone uh, was in balance to just slightly shear dominant. So all that to say, ahead of this line, we had no issues meeting our basic three ingredients method that we needed for mesovortex generation and the potential for QLCS tornadoes uh, with this event as it came through Iowa. So in addition to the uh, three ingredients being met, we also had several confidence and uh, confidence builders and nudgers that were present along this line uh, as it moved into our area. We had the drop in reflectivity on the backside of it. Uh, we had a near line break, also near the entry point, plenty of zero to three kilometer cape, and it had a history of developing mesovortices uh, with confirmed tornadoes and TDSs as this was moving through eastern Nebraska and into western Iowa and the counties that were covered by the Omaha CWA. So on this next slide here in the white line, I have drawn in where the updraft downdraft convergence zone is present. And one thing to point out is on the southern end of this line here, we were actually just slightly cold pool dominate, uh, dominant with this portion of the line. And subsequently in this area, even with the high shear and all the other ingredients that were present, we had no mesovortex generation that occurred and no QLCS tornadoes uh, that were confirmed. We did have a lot of straight line wind damage with that. Uh, several of those were in excess of 70 miles per hour as well. But initially at the onset, as this was moving into West Central Iowa, the three ingredients method did pretty well with helping us anticipate the threat for QLCS tornadoes and allowed us to put out the correct severe thunderstorm warnings and tornado warnings uh, for portions of the line that were most likely to produce. Now, fast forward about 45, 50 minutes later, uh, which these traveled very far because of the 70 to 80 mile per hour storm motion that we had with this. And we see something that's a little bit different here. We still have an environment with nearly 70 knots of zero to three kilometer bulk shear. We still have the Boeing structure and we still have a contracting bookend vortex on the north end of this line. But you'll notice that the two southern mesocyclones there that I have uh, circled, they're either occurring in the middle of the highest reflectivities or they're occurring on the back side of it. 
And so this is something that's important to note because I, I think that this can be a situation where the three ingredients method becomes a bit more difficult to apply, especially when you're trying to issue the appropriate warnings uh, for this particular line here. We've also had several other notable tornado events over the past decade in Iowa where the mesovortex has happened on the, either the backside of the QLCS and sometimes has even happened well into the stratiform rain and has produced either EF1 or EF2 damage. So this is still the same radar frame. I just highlighted once again where that updraft downdraft convergent zone is. And again, the southern portion of that line is just slightly cold pool dominant there where we have no mesovortex generation and we had no QLCS tornadoes that occurred with it. But where we did have uh, the most robust mesovortex generation is right where we get this uh, UDCZ entry point right here. And again, these are mostly here on the backside or in the middle of the highest uh, reflectivities. So one of the questions after reviewing this event that I asked was, is it possible for the updrafts to become extremely tilted, but still have the ability to produce tornadoes here on the backside of this? Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Justin Gibbs from the Decision Training Branch and Tony Liza from uh, OU Cero for uh, email discussions about mesovortices developing on the backside of this. And it definitely is possible. And in Justin Gibbs' study that he uh, published a 2021 paper on, he noted that a lot of these mesocyclones that develop either in the middle or on the backside of the QLCS tend to happen in higher shear environments like we had on December 15th. And oftentimes that can result in storm relative winds that will ultimately then force the hydrometers uh, further downstream, in this case, east of the line, while the low level updraft still remains behind the line. And it's possible that the close proximity to the bookend vortex could be changing the dynamics uh, of the QLCS as well, particularly may play a role with horizontal shearing instability that may be on the backside of this. But I think the key takeaway point here is that in these highly sheared environments, we need to be really careful that there are times that the three ingredients method may be a bit tougher to um, imply than they can be with other events that may have lower amounts of shear. So that's all I have for the mesovortex generation. I'll hand it over to Rod now for the Sentinel data. All right, thank you, Alex. So as we talked about, obviously this is occurring in December when we had not had tornadoes in our area either. Um, in December, much like Sioux Falls. Um, but we typically have crop crops around and we're obviously big proponents of using satellite data to um, detect tornado tracks as well. So these uh, examples are basically what we've seen with crops in place, but obviously as we talked about, that's not necessarily the case that we had in December. So I did take this and adopted this from Tony Liza. And on the left-hand side, you're looking at a typical um, storm moving at 30 miles per hour, and I just used the base uh, radial velocity of seven meters per second and tangential velocities of 20 meters per second, or basically rotation, and comparing it to storms that were moving at an average of 75 miles per hour. So all 63 tornadoes, uh, we calculated up the average motion based on the data and, and radar, and it averaged out to 75 miles per hour, these are moving. So you can see actually these orangish or yellowish um, this is what your damage pattern should look like. And you can see how much it changes as your storm motions move. And actually for Iowa, um, I believe five of our top six or six of the top seven number of days with EF2 tornadoes actually have storm motions greater than 50 miles per hour. So anytime you get these fast moving um, systems moving 75 miles per hour, you can see how QLCS tornadoes actually can be dangerous and should be warned for um, because they tend to move quite quickly and you can get these much uh, areas of damage on this uh, the right forward moving flank. And then just comparing the two um, overlaid on top of each other, how the damage pattern changes as you increase speed out to 75 miles per hour. You can see how it becomes much more um, straight line. And as Peter Rogers mentioned, um, it can be more difficult to determine uh, tornadic damage in this type of environment. So with that, uh, we did our methodology basically setting the two captured images across much of our area on December 15th ahead of the storm. So actually that day that storms occurred, we had some good, a good pass, especially across our central and south. Um, several good passes occurred following that event on the 22nd and 25th, Christmas day as well. And then Northern Iowa, we did not have as good a quality imagery. Uh, we had stratus in the area, we had snow cover impacting, so we didn't get as good imagery across our north throughout most of that. Uh, we did use radar data to utilize to determine areas of search satellite imagery in addition to areas of damage to help find uh, tracks, which I, I should note, 
we weren't exp expecting to find many tracks in this because again we're very crop dependent with a lot of these um, storms so the fact that we found tracks with this was pretty amazing across uh, bare ground and then we did use a sentinel eo browser sliding bar uh, compare tool uh, misspelling there and then animated imagery was utilized compare so overall uh, of our 40 tornadoes in our area um, 28 were observed in sentinel high resolution data so that is 10 meter resolution not the very high one meter or less resolution you see in google earth uh, that imagery captured roughly around 10 percent to even 100 percent of the tracks so we did have five tornadoes that we um, have found in their entirety in the sentinel imagery and again just to remember um, it's holistic report approach combination of the radar and all various types of data to come up with these tracks so um, just compare on the right the satellite imagery and if you can see very small i did overlay the uh, dat tracks so we did are able to use these tracks also to give higher resolution to our tracks in the dat um, you can see before and after images um, from december 15th the day of and then afterwards one of our better tracks that occurred but uh, one thing alex talked about tilting i'll show in the next image some of these um, as we move on some of these tornadoes at, and couplets are actually moving just to the left almost 0.4 to 0.5 nautical miles of where the actual track occurred so there is tilting going on with that and one thing you know going to read your polygonology is that these tracks do aren't necessarily run underneath where your mesovortices are at so these are actually offset some of these up to a half mile at only 3,000 feet they can see another one this is actually a, um, a high uh, wind turbine blown over and then in a cog confinement with that and then finally, um, just a quick demonstration of how to use our, the EO browser compare tool. Uh, as I play this video, it'll be about a 25 second video. You go up, you get to your image, hit the compare button, change your date. So we go from the, to the 15th, hit compare again here, and then go up and we'll select the compare. And then you can use a slider bar at that point. And this is one of our, I talked about one of our better tracks that we occur. So use slider bar, then you can help this, use this to reveal, reveal tracks that occurred um, with it. So if you have any questions that, please let us know. Um, we'll happy to step you through it. And I believe that is it. So thank you. All right. Thank, thank you both, Alex and Rod. Any questions for Des Moines? I wanted, to, I wanted to mention what what were the uh, what were the widths on on your tornado tracks and if I may have missed it I mean look the, the few that were on here look pretty pretty small <laughs> yeah exactly Andy they were quite small um, overall which uh, as you mentioned you most of our damage is on that right forward plank so we weren't we were getting pretty um, small I I don't believe we had many over a hundred yards by any means and you can see their background image there that. That's yeah. a lot of what our uh, QLCS tornadoes look like. They're pretty narrow overall, but uh, highly focused winds. Yeah, yeah, an intense, an intense wind field in a very, very small <laughs> width. <laughs> Jeez. All right, and thanks too on the good, good QLCS uh, review, especially in these and very and fast moving systems. So. All right, we'll move on to our next speaker then here and that will be Omaha uh, from Omaha we'll go to the MIC there Suzanne okay everybody hear me okay yep you yep. screen great well hi hi everybody um Suzanne Fortin on the MIC here at Omaha and it just so happens uh a lot of the people that were critical and, and and putting together the AAR had other things going on today. So tag, you get me, uh, former Sue. So how about that? Um, anyway, a, a thanks out is this was a uh, more than one person uh, putting this together. Uh, kudos to Dave Pearson and uh, Paul Feynman who actually prepared the written AAR and then the presentation was a combined effort from Becky Kern, Dave Pearson, Brian Bargenbrook, Katie Gross. Uh, I could go on. So most of the staff was involved in this. Uh, this wonderful graphic was prepared by Katie. Hey, Suzanne, um, let, me, 
Suzanne, let me stop you. I'm not seeing your screen yet. Oh, there it is. It popped up on my other window. And yeah, I have, I have your uh, uh, desktop screen with a. Uh, let me hold on. Let me move it over. Stand by. No problem. All right. There? Better? That's better. Yep. Yep. There it is. There it is. All right. Okay. Sorry. Right. Too many screens. Anyway, um, I wanted to highlight that, you know, this is really more than the 15th. Um, the event really, uh, some of our messaging began on December 8th. And uh, actually, the last damage, this sort of damage track assessment was done on Christmas Day. Um, as I was driving south on 75 Highway um, to go see my family for Christmas. So, uh, you know, uh, over a week kind of in combination of preparation and the post. So more than just one day. Um, you can see the uh, kind of the, the, the interesting facts of, of the event. Um, zero fatalities. Unfortunately, three horses uh, perished in the event. We had 120 plus mile tracks of uh, tornadoes across the CWA. Our count, uh, 25 tornadoes that day, a little less than, or much less than, than Des Moines. See, uh, for us, no fires were reported on that day, though there was a, a high risk for that. Highest wind uh, record broken for the Lincoln Airport that day of 93 miles per hour. And, and as, uh, as Hastings pointed out during their presentation in Des Moines, total number of tornadoes up to this day across both of Nebraska and Iowa were only five in the month of December for Nebraska and six for Iowa. So evidently a, a fairly rare and historic event. Okay, here's a nice loop of the, the line as it's going through. As you can see, it, it travels very quickly across the CWA with it only essentially lasting about four hours from the time we had, uh, we issued the first warning until we issued the last warning. It was a day that we saw multiple hazards going on, strong winds, tornadoes, dust, and snow. Also like, Des Moines, we had record temperatures broken in Norfolk, Lincoln, and Omaha, with all temperatures being 40 degrees above the normal for the 15th of December. Dew points abnormally high as well, upper 50s to middle 60s, 30 degrees above the climatological normal. So an evidently very rare event. It was classified as a derecho given its spatial extent with uh, winds in between 58 and 99 miles per hour, at least in our CWA as it raced across the area. I already touched on the record wind speed that was reported in Lincoln. Post-frontal winds were just as strong behind the line uh, between 49 and 81 miles per hour. So the, the damage and uh, the threat did not end just with the line and the tornadoes. I already touched on the, the temporal extent, very brief, only four hours across the entire CWA. And yes, I see an error here. Uh, we, we increased the number of tornadoes up to 25 and, um, oh, 25, 21 tour warnings issued and eight severe. And we damaged 25 tornadoes. And again, damage surveys between the 16th and the last was done on December 25th. So as I was speaking to the, the timeline, we really started focusing on the storm on the 8th, uh, just with uh, some general information in our AFB. Then, then we started increasing the, the wording in our HWO and AFBs as we got to the 10th. And again, talking about the high wind potential in the HWO as we got to the 12th. Our first IDSS packet issued on the 13th. We held the first conference call on the 14th. Of course, the tornado watch, as already spoken about, was issued on the 15th. We also conducted a 
separate and I didn't, it's not in here, but we did do another partner call on the 15th as well. And then the timeline, the first tornado warning. And as, like I said, uh, the, as the first tornado, first severe, then the first tornado warning and something that Hastings already touched on. We had to shelter in place. We did have a tornado that developed just to the Southwest of the WFO, it actually dis dissipated just before it got there. But as I'll touch on in our best practices, we felt it was a good, good idea to to shelter in place and and basically practice what we preach. So we were we presented that on social media, and I'll touch on that in a bit. Again, it was a a almost week long process, and not just a single event. And uh, to to get everybody prepared, both um, our partners and customers and the public and internally in preparation for this event. So here's the timeline. I already showed that before the tornado watch issued at one o'clock in the afternoon. Less than an hour later, the first severe was issued, then the first tour only 20 minutes after. And again, the tornado watch ended only about three hours um, after the initial uh, watch was issued. Uh, we did pretty good on our stats. These are probably still in the works. I don't know if these, uh, we've, we've gotten the exact stats back in here, but again, POD of 78 and a, for at least for the tornadoes and, and Rod and Alex already spoke to this, the, 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 the pace of these tornadoes uh, or tornadic storms was so quick that getting a lead time much better than 11 minutes was very, very difficult given uh, the, the most of the, the tornadoes were mainly QLCS in origin and so were very brief in, in nature and in, in temporal scale. Eight severe thunderstorm warnings issued, uh, POD on those of 100%, and we had a very good lead time on those. Mainly, we use the severe as sort of a heads up, it's coming uh, for all of our, our customers and partners. So a lot of reports, like many other places, 102 combined reports, uh, 22 of winds in excess of 70, um, 13 in excess of 80, so a very extreme day across our area. Similarly, uh, our EF scale, the, the max was an EF2. We did rate nine of our tornadoes as EF2. Uh, the majority were EF1, and as you can see, they were scattered across the CWA in general. Uh, very few or little hail reports on that day, which uh, makes sense given uh, the synoptic and nature, but obviously the, the bigger threats were the damaging winds and the tornadic threat. Okay, so what went well before? Uh, we like Des Moines and Sioux Falls and Wichita and Topeka, there were multiple hazards going on that day. We were dealing with snow already uh, in the northern part of our CWA. Of course, we had a high wind threat, we had a fire threat, and we had a severe weather threat. So multiple hazards going on. And we chose just to message using sort of a, a very generic graph, but uh, using, using words to describe what was going on. So a little bit of a difference from uh, our neighbors there in Sioux Falls. So internal collaboration, that was very key for us getting prepared for the event both the, the staff working in ops and then those working remotely. There was a very active chat session going on to uh, everybody chiming in, giving their, their thoughts about the storm evolution and, and initiation and also collaborating with our external partners. We did proactive staffing uh, two or three days before we started looking at potential staffing plans and who we needed uh, at what times and and what positions. And we we have a virtual kind of whiteboard staffing area that we do uh, to collect uh, times that people can work different shifts and, and come in. Uh, we are also proactive in, in issuing our IDSS packets and the webinars as well as I thought. 
Um, the, the partners that led uh, in advance uh, were critical in, for our partners in that the uh, schools were closed on, on December 15th for much of our area or early dismissals. And it also led to several businesses closing uh, based on our messaging. We happened to have a Pathfinders meeting just the day before on the 14th. And so we collaborated with the Nebraska Department of Transportation to get some messaging up on the sign boards as well, to speak to people about changing their commute times or act, yeah, afternoon activities, given the, the high threat of high winds and potential severe weather. Also, we did some advanced collaboration with SBC to get them to extend the moderate risk back into, into Nebraska. And uh, I give a shout out to SPC. They did a great post uh, of the historic context of uh, the moderate risk given the most northern moderate risk area ever in the month of December. What, what, well, during, I already spoke to, we had our, our basically our staffing plan on the day. So we use a big whiteboard where it's very visible, where we put the different positions. We follow a severe weather operations plan and, and give everybody an idea about uh, what they're doing and their role for that day. And obviously this changes as the day goes on, but we have an initial plan, uh, very visible for everybody to see. Obviously, uh, and in this case, we, we incorporated uh, staff that normally don't assist in severe weather operation. Our ASA was assisting with NAWAS. We had an electronics technician in-house and he was helping with all kinds of electronic equipment issues that we had and also helping just basically organize operations a little. Um, our service hydrologist was helping with Ground Truth and LSR. I was kind of a catch-all. I was doing comms. I was doing coordination. I was launching the balloon and I was fetching pizza. Uh, we did enlist the remote mesoanalyst room. Unfortunately, we had to start stop using this because it, we our focus went into warning mode, but kind of a suggestion is maybe have some sort of open webinar for a more visual RMA where somebody just says, hey, you look at this kind of thing. We did follow the watch warning gap, test bed kind of social media strategy, uh, something uh, not so typical of most areas. We have a long time IDSS going on with uh, off at Air Force Base, specifically the 55th uh, wing to help coordinate for the staff for um, off it flight ops. And so we are doing very proactive TAF coordination due to the both non-convective and convective strong wind potential. Ended up having four sectors, one for the Omaha Council Bluffs area, and the large severe's kind of a heads up and with more focus for the tornadoes given their, their fast movement uh, in general. We did have to go into service backup and GID stepped in and, and helped us out in a critical moment. We ended up sheltering, sheltering in place for about five to 10 minutes. And here's the little safe place selfie that we took. I think I'm kneeling on the ground trying to get the the door to close here. But uh, anyway, that was uh, received well. And I think, like I said, it sent a good message to shelter in place during a tornadic activity. Um, what went out well afterwards? Uh, a creation of a summary web page right away to, to give information to the public and to the media for survey pur purposes, preloading mesh and rotation tracks on the iPads. Um, preparing talking points and of our own, and also thank you very much to the CR Rock for creating some talking points for us as well uh, for for damage and events happening outside of our CWA specifically. Again, uh, we had the office staff doing a lot of QC of the DAT points as as the people were out in the field and inputting LSRs. So very helpful and also getting mutual aid from our partners from the Department of Transportation and Iowa Department of Transportation and the EMs for our surveys. And we also did a very limited use of Sentinel satellite, uh, similar to Des Moines, 
we had cloud cover over most of the areas impacted by tornadoes, but we did take a look and it was very useful. So I'd recommend that. What didn't go so well before? Well, I already spoke to, we were dealing with snow right before the event. So we were trying to deal with uh, advisory criteria, snow messaging, which uh, kind of uh, muted the, the initial basically messaging for this particular event. Um, there was a little bit of some inconsistency internally with our AFDs, but uh, we've addressed that already. As many already have spoken to, there was a little bit of a downplay by SPC in the day two to three outlooks and may have delayed the issuance of the moderate, but again, through collaboration, uh, SPC uh, did end up uh, extending it back into Nebraska. Uh, as noted, we didn't have any really specific analog for this event, very rare event. Um, there's a bunch of uh, these listed, but if you click on these, it, it pops up something similar to this, where it doesn't show any type of impacts for particular events. And again, the ensembles, you always have to watch that because it essentially mutes some of these uh, uh, more uh, out into the extended range. So, so the signal of uh, exactly the timing. We did for our webinars experience some lags with, in basically display and audio, uh, likely due to some temporary bandwidth issues and uh, roaming profiles in terms of uh, how those um, handle from, from machine to machine. We also found out we did not have a non, uh, didn't have a standard mic and camera set up at each workstation. Also what didn't do, go so well, um, it was very difficult for local mesoanalysis because we had to go to four sectors. And so we lost that uh, critical input. So mainly somebody was having to both do radar analysis and mesoscale sim simultaneous, simultaneously, unless uh, somebody happened to be looking at something and, and, uh, and shouted across the room. Um, the RMA chat room kind of faded into the background as I spoke to because it, we were just focused on uh, in the warning mode. We sort of ran out of real estate. Uh, we had to cram up. I had a temporary work area here. Dave Pearson was over in the corner. All of our workstations were in use. And so we had to kind of cobble together things on the fly. Um, certain phones weren't ringing, so we're addressing that. As already spoken to, I think by Sioux Falls, a lot of unnecessary banners and beeping going on by AWIPS uh, due to, well, we had an RMR going with uh, several of our surrounding radars and this general messages that we got on AWIPS. Uh, we did also note that in uh, trying to update our grid, some of the deterministic winds and wind gusts were too low. so. You know, when you're in a time crunch, it's, uh, we had to really uh, work to get those winds to match more effectively. And, and using some of that uh, probability, I think we went with the 50 or 75 percentile to get the winds to be more reasonable. And one kind of uh, unfortunate event happened with uh, one of our local EOCs was overwhelmed by uh, when the national media uh, picked up on what was going on in Omaha they decided to bombard the EOC with calls and questions after seeing a message by emergency management posted in chat. And, and that didn't go so well, obviously, with emergency management, given they were really trying to focus on uh, getting resources to where they were needed. Uh, also, as kind of a funny aside, our, our pizza was held hostage. Um, I put in the order around 3.15 and of course we went into shelter at about 3.55 and couldn't get our pizza until about 5.45 uh, because Casey's was sheltering in place and then they shelter in place for two hours after. So we had some pizza, but cold pizza. Also what didn't go well after, uh, almost done. Yeah, extremely oh, narrow yes. band tracks is already spoken to. Widest tracks, maybe 10 yards. Uh, very difficult to ascertain in some of these tornado tracks. Uh, the widest, I think, was about 100. We had reduced government vehicles for use, uh, given our WCM was out assisting with the survey of the Mayfield tornado. So very difficult. Um, 
kind of a suggestion, maybe we did reach out to, to Hastings to help us with some surveys, but they were overwhelmed. Perhaps some sort of mutual aid for surveys beyond just uh, of a, a EF3 exceedance, maybe the number of tornadoes too could be something as a threshold to help with um, with mutual uh, with help for surveys. And again, like everybody else, staff fatigue, and then given the time of year, just staff availability. And last but not least, here's our actions. These are internal to our office, but I'm sure others have has the same type of actions after the work. So that will do it for me. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Lots, lots going on, I know, for your office, so. All right, we need to keep moving on here. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to pop in the chat and um, we can try and address them. So uh, next up, we'll pass this along to Nick at Chen Hassan. All right, hello everybody. Uh, we'll get started here talking about what happened up in Minnesota and West Central Wisconsin. So I'll be presenting, I will start off talking about a lot of the pre-event stuff and I'll pass it off to Melissa Dye to cover the during and post event. First, just giving a quick overview of what happened up for us. We had multiple hazards on the north end of this system. Similarly to our neighbors to the south, we had lots of high wind from thunderstorms and we had multiple tornadoes, 15 in our area confirmed. Then after that, we had high synoptic winds up to 70 miles per hour. But unlike some of our neighbors to the south, we also had up to four inches of snow and accumulating ice along some of our northern CWA. And in addition, early in the day, due to rapid warm up from previous snow, that led to a significant snow melt and therefore dense fog due to all the extra moisture in the air. All this together led to a significant media attention, both from local national media, and we even had the Minnesota governor requesting regular updates throughout the night as the event unfolded. So first, let's talk a little bit about what was going on before that. Uh, December 10th was a very big day, primarily for our uh, friends to the south down in Kentucky. But on the northern end, we also did have a pretty significant event as well. We got some pretty heavy snow, uh, up to near two feet of snow in some parts of the southeast Twin Cities metro and surrounding areas. Um, all of that gave a very solid snowpack that we had to really melt off to really get much of a chance to warm up and develop the kind of instability for severe weather. The warm-up before that led to some pretty significant changes in the snow melt. Um, you can see on December 15th, the drops that are noted on the slide here, dropping significant amount of snow, and all of that led to a lot more moisture and cloud cover that had impacts on exactly how much we could warm up that day. Specifically, I want to focus in on MSP here being our population center. You can see the evolution with time as everything went forward. So you can see the drop in snow depth from the 18Z report on the 14th to the 18Z report on the 15th, went from eight inches down to basically no snow. So for 24 hours, we melted eight inches of snow. And so what did that do? Well, that rapid warm up made our morning balloon launch look like this at our office, where you can barely see our radar in the distance. And even a little bit later in the day as the day shift arrived, this is what it started to look like where it's still not much better. Very dense fog caused impacts with people trying to get around that morning. But now let's talk a little bit about what did that do to the severe weather? Well, you can see with this temperature graphic up here, you can see how much things warm up in South Central Minnesota versus how much further north it doesn't warm up much and the Twin Cities being kind of on the northern edge of that warmer temperature. So that does play a big deal in trying to figure out where does that instability build up. So if you look at this graphic here, that mixed layer cape doesn't really get super far north in the Minnesota. It's more of a south central to southeast Minnesota up into west central Wisconsin for where we actually get some instability. And even though this was more of a high shear, low cape type of setup, we still needed to get enough instability to really get things moving to have developed that deeper convection that was able to got, cause those larger impacts. And as I mentioned on the last slide, here's a look at the shear. Uh, we had some pretty impressive shear, especially in the lowest 500 meters. Things were really spinning significantly within that area. And that really was the driving force that made this such a notable event especially across southern Minnesota into western Wisconsin. 
And once again, just to show that's what the cape was as a reminder. Now, what did we do about messaging with this with so many different hazards going on? Well, in the days up to it, um, we tried to cover the fact of both events as long as well as the wind. So here's a good example here. We're trying to cover the chance of thunderstorms with an SBC outlook, as well as the chance of snow and the wind, trying to get it all into one image. Um, instead of trying to provide lots of different images, trying to combine everything together into one. And that's being messaged as well in text products, as well as the graphical products and AFDs and throughout a variety of things and really trying to stress how rare and unprecedented this is to have in the month of December. In addition, here's an example of trying to note the historical nature of it how rare it was just back when this was a slight risk coming into Minnesota, let alone the eventual moderate risk upgrade, which was never done before. Moving on to talk about some more things here, some of the key messages that were broken out within our forecast discussions, and this has become a thing we have started to focus on throughout our discussions um, and even more of a regular practice that has gotten positive feedback, trying to focus on the main things that come up, talking about the severe weather, the high winds, and the potential for that snow, ice, and flash freeze around the back end. It truly was a rare storm with multiple hazards throughout different parts of our forecast area. And you can see here, we did eventually move into more of a similar setup to what a lot of what Sioux Falls was doing with their messaging as well. One thing we did really to try to emphasize things as well and kind of a pre-watch type messaging, there was a special weather statement put out talking about the volatile day of weather it has not been seen before in mid-December for our area. Um, with the time we have today, I won't read out the whole SPS, but feel free to go back and look at it later if you wish to read it, but that was something we wanted to do to enhance our messaging. In addition, the messaging did get a response. You can see here with our insights on this Facebook post here, we got an impression of over 400,000 with uh, 4,000 reactions, almost 2,500 comments. This had significant reach throughout the event, and this is just the one in the morning, and significant happened, especially with the watch post that came out later in the day. Uh, we had a local webinar, when we had a Pathfinder webinar with the state of Minnesota, we had to deal with multiple impacts from high winds in the south to winter weather in the north and with because of the snowfall and flash freeze risk. I uh, also talked with the Metropolitan Airports Council at MSB Airport to give them a good idea of the fact that they could be seeing tropical storm to possibly hurricane force winds sustained as those winds came through after the storms. We also had three DSS packets sent out and we attempted to use Facebook Live, but with little experience at our office with that, it did not work as great as we had hoped. As we moved on through the day, uh, this is what was the graphic that started out the day. So you can see that's where we put out the moderate risk, tried to message it out, and then we had more briefings that came out throughout the day as we tried to update people with the newest information. Now, just a quick bit on winter weather before we dive into what happened during the event. The backside of this storm, had we were primarily concerned with flash freeze and having up to four inches of three to four inches of snow, along with those winds gusting up to 50 miles per hour. There was concern about that blowing snow leading to blizzard conditions, and we also wanted to get these decisions made about winter weather before it started because we were going to be in severe moderate risk level operations and did not want it to be worrying about issuing new warnings during operations and try to get that done in collaboration with our neighbors in Grand Forks and Duluth in advance of the storm that afternoon. And it was a hard decision and we settled on warnings with some advisories in the north but there was concern about how much that snow could blow around. And with that I will hand things off to Melissa to cover the during the event. Uh, Melissa, it looks like you're self-muted. Oops. There you go. Okay. All right. Awesome. Sorry. All right. So as we got into it, um, the first uh, thing that we sent out is our staff availability sheet. And this is something that we typically send out 
uh, before um, any kind of severe event that we have. So this was first sent out uh, the morning of December 14th and finalized. Um, and then with that, we were able to utilize our op duty assignments chart. Um, this is also something that we've used quite a bit. Um, and I've only been at this office since April of 2020, but this was definitely the busiest um, event that we've had. We had pretty much every role filled. And uh, like some of our other neighboring offices said, um, we had more people in ops than we had workstations at times. So, um, but this has been a really useful tool for us as far as keeping track of of who's doing what and um, also incorporating uh, the teleworkers that we have as well. So uh, just a quick look at our ops setup. Uh, we had our warning forecasters in the middle kind of mirroring each other. Um, we had social media and uh, graphic and uh, phones on either side. Um, we had more of our um, routine duties with winter weather, grids, and taps um, on that side. And then we ended up having to um, use some of the cubicles um, over here for um, some of our other duties. So um, I will be talking about this uh, in the after section as well as far as how this setup worked out. So um, things got started uh, with a tornado watch that was issued at 1.20 p.m. And this just included a few of our uh, southernmost counties. Uh, it wasn't until 525 when we issued our first severe. Uh, unfortunately, this one did not end up verifying as uh, the storms weakened uh, as they actually made it into our area. So tried to be a little bit proactive with warning lead time, but ended up not working out as great. And just before seven, we did finally issue our first tornado warning. Um, this did end up being the first confirmed tornado in the state of Minnesota for the month of December. Um, I think like another office had mentioned, uh, we had two warning forecasters and they split up the duties between severe and uh, tornadoes just because it was easier for one person to keep an eye out for brief spin-ups um, within the, the line. And again, since these storms were moving at you know 50 to 60 miles an hour, um, that was that was helpful. So between 1.30 and uh, during all of the warning operations, um, we did a 21Z special balloon launch. We had national media contacting us for interviews. As Nick mentioned earlier, the governor uh, was asking for uh, two hourly updates um, via email, um, and that continued through at least midnight, I believe. Um, we had a miscommunication that led to needing a second uh, release of the balloon. And another miscommunication um, that kind of caused some unneeded chaos with social media was a tweet that was sent out where we used the word uh, confirmed tornado um, when it was actually only a report. So um, it was hard to kind of walk that back because it did get so much media attention. So um, if you click one more time, Nick, um, we ended up trying to. Um, you know, walk it back and say that, you know, we would need to um, go out and actually see the damage before it could be confirmed. So um, that did seem to quiet things down for a little bit, but it was definitely an uh, unnecessary distraction. So overall, um, we only ended up issuing eight severe thunderstorm warnings and only two tornado warnings. Um, we did use the tornado possible tag in all of our severe thunderstorm warnings. Um, just because, like Nick said, that environment, everything was spinning, and we just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, if we couldn't get something out in a timely manner, that there was at least a uh, tornado possible tag in there. In all, uh, we had 15 tornadoes in our CWA with a total of 24 in Minnesota and another 10 in Wisconsin. Um, eight of our 15 tornadoes actually occurred within the same county, Freeborn County, which is down in uh, southern Minnesota. Um, like other offices have said, the uh, widths of these uh, tracks were very, very small. Um, also, due to the uh, snowpack and the frozen ground, we had a hard time uh, finding some of these tracks. Um, but <clears throat> something else to mention is that some of these storms cross CWA lines from Des Moines and La Crosse. 
So our coordination with our neighboring offices for both morning operations and doing the surveys was uh, incredibly useful. So as we get into um, what actually happened and lessons learned, um, again, we found 15 tornadoes. Uh, there were six damage surveys. Um, damage surveys actually continued into uh, early January um, out in Wisconsin, just to kind of wrap a few things up. Um, the survey team, which I know Nick was a part of, um, some of their challenges with the uh, cold weather that we had, the iPads for the, um, the use of the DAP were so cold that they would turn off and were literally frozen. So that was uh, kind of an unexpected challenge. Um, as I mentioned, because it was snow covered, um, there was not a whole lot of damage indicators to look at because um, trees were bare and crops were um, obviously not growing. And then uh, fast moving storms. So trying to determine um, tornado versus straight line winds. Also, obviously, this got a lot of media attention. Um, so there was a lot of questions throughout the day of the 16th asking us um, if we had ratings yet or how many tornadoes. So that was something um, that was, you know, kind of hard to, to work around at times. And again, the teamwork within our neighboring offices was very helpful. As you can see, a lot of these tornado tracks were very close to CWA boundaries. Um, we had a couple of EF2 uh, tornado damage here. So the one on the left is from uh, Southern Minnesota and Heartland. Um, and then the other one on the right, also an EF2 was in Stanley, Wisconsin. As far as the high winds on the back side of this, um, our peak wind gust was at uh, Redwood Falls uh, Airport, which gusted to 78 miles an hour. Um, a lot of these high winds um, came in after 9 p.m. or so, so aviation impacts were minimal, um, but there were a few delays at MSP because of the wind. Winter weather, um, we ended up with kind of a wintry mix of one to four inches of snow. There were travel impacts across Interstate 94, which runs from Minneapolis through St. Cloud to Alexandria. Um, there was a flash freeze and blowing snow with those wind gusts up to 70 miles an hour. Um, but we did not have any official blizzard conditions, so our uh, headline choices ended up working out. Uh, this, oh, that's okay. um, so lessons learned. Um, like I had talked about, the workstation seating arrangement um, is something that we'd like to um, kind of look into, and I'll touch on that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, we, because this was obviously a very unique scenario, um, trying to improve our decision process um, in, um, you know, situations like this, that's something that we'd like to, to take a look at. Um, developing pre-event warning strategies to optimize lead time. Um, we kind of did this with splitting up the duties between tornado and severe, um, but I think that that's still something that we can improve upon. Something that shouldn't be an issue anymore, but was definitely an issue at the time, was um, we were not able to get the um, super res data from the lacrosse radar. And that would have been very helpful in seeing uh, more of the details in the storms as they headed into west central Wisconsin. Um, but again, that's now getting into AWIPS on its own. So that has resolved itself. Um, and then I know that we have it on our list as um, one of the duty assignments, but excuse me, but being um, more aware of making sure that one forecaster is taking care of all of the routine duties. So I wanted to touch on what kind of went on with the organization and as far as uh, what worked and what didn't. So. We had good communication between the warning forecasters as they were sitting next to each other and we could share um, information back and forth and look at each other's monitors. However, our first warning um, did not make it out to the uh, 800 megahertz radio operator and as a result was not sent out to the counties in a timely manner. So um, that's something that definitely needs to be improved. 
it worked out well having uh, social media on either side of the room because they could communicate what they were seeing uh, on social media to warning forecasters and we could communicate um, you know what we were doing through them so they could uh, add value to some of our social media posts. Um, things were kind of fuzzy in this area with the uh, mesoanalyst sitting close to one warning forecaster. Um, it was hard to hear at times over um, to the other side of the room um, just because there was so much activity going on and obviously the phones were ringing and there's interviews going on and all that. Um, and then the winter weather grids and TAFs people, um, it was also kind of tricky to keep track of who was actually doing what. So, all right, so um, other lessons learned, um, like Nick mentioned, we attempted a Facebook Live and that failed. So um, getting that worked out ahead of time is on our list. Um, we've done this before, but um, continuing to use a Google Chat to help document our uh, train of thoughts to help um, engage teleworkers and bounce ideas off each other when we all can't be in the office. It's also good to go back and look at it as an archive. Um, and then just a reminder for all of us in the office to call around to county dispatch offices uh, to ask for damage reports and maybe consider postponing uh, surveys if road conditions or temperatures are a little bit too treacherous. So that's all we have for you. All right. Well, thank you very much to both Nick and Melissa there. So we are going to move on to our next office here. And just give me a second here. Seem to have lost something here. Um, just a second. Actually, if you if anybody has any um, questions for Minneapolis, just uh, feel free to um, let them know. Um, don't know why I've messed up. Hey Bruce, can you move the next the next one? Actually, looks uh, like I got, I, got, I got it back. Here we go. All right, Justin, you from Duluth, you're up. All right. Uh, hopefully you can hear me and see my screen. Yes, I All can right. see it. All right. Perfect. Okay. So uh, up here in uh, WFO Duluth area, so we didn't have a whole lot uh, in terms of severe weather, but still a very challenging uh, scenario for us. So before I go on, just an acknowledgement of Patrick Ide, uh, my Sue here for putting, helping to put these slides together. So as you can see here at this timeline of our watch warnings advisories uh, for this event, you know we had to deal with uh, not only high winds on the land, which turned out to be probably our uh, one of the two big um, uh, land-based hazards that we had to deal with, but also high and marine, as you can see. Leading up to the event, we had uh, gale watches and storm watches over Western Lake Superior that were ultimately upgraded to a gale warning and storm warning. So gale warnings uh, 34 to 47 knots and storm warnings 48 knots or greater. So, you know, very hazardous on Lake Superior. Additionally, we also uh, issued a very rare high wind warning for our CWA, which I believe the last time we issued one was uh, I believe 2001. So you know because of how forested we are up here, you know high winds are are not really a major threat. But with this event and how anomalously strong it was, uh, we definitely uh, felt confident on pulling the trigger for that. Uh, on the on the winter side, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of snow as you saw with uh, the Chanhassen slides but we did have concerns with flash freeze as we had one to two inches of heavy rainfall followed uh, very quickly by uh, you know strong arctic air cold air convection and snow behind it uh, in terms of thunderstorms we had uh, you know you know quite a bit of storms across our region but uh, largely they were elevated in nature 
Uh, so we were really on the fringe of the severe threat. And ultimately, we did not issue a severe thunderstorm warning. Uh, we were very close, but we, we did not. So for this particular event, uh, at least pre-storm, we had a, a science briefing slide deck uh, that kind of acted as a, a living science uh, you know, slide deck that you know, basically allowed us to, to add a, you know, new information uh, as, as they came in. So kind of wanted to switch actually to, to that just real quick to show you what it looked like. So you can kind of see here how it's broken down by the day and particular shift things to watch for, uh, maybe some forecast gotchas. Then we broke it down by, you know, uh, things to keep an eye on for convection, you know, like soundings and updraft felicity tracks and that kind of thing. Winter-based information like uh, probability of snow greater than four inches from the NBM 4.1 on the uh, What's Up viewer. So just this kind of, uh, this, this going uh, science sharing presentation that we had uh, going for this event. And really, um, throughout the event, we tried to really uh, highlight the use of, uh, you know, we want to highlight the use of conceptual models married with the the probabilistic tools, as you kind of see here, you know, using like uh, the ensemble situational awareness table, the NAPES percentiles, um, like the, uh, like the NCEP uh, IVT, looking at uh, you know atmospheric rivers and that kind of thing. So, the like I said, the NBM 4.1 snowfall probabilities, uh, max wind gust elements. So, really tried to to marry uh, the conceptual models with the probabilistic data sets. In terms of our messaging, like I've been saying, very complex scenario since our our CWA was basically uh, you know bisected by kind of the transition zone from from snow to rain. So um, this graphic, as you see here, was taken directly out of our DSS packet that showed the timing and the hazards for certain regions of our CWA. So you can see um, you know, the, the, the thunderstorm potential for Wednesday evening and into Wednesday night, even some severe thunderstorms possible for our southeast Hayward, Wisconsin and the, uh, the south shore of Lake Superior in northern Wisconsin. And then the timing of that transition from rain to snow, and even that, that area of, of flash freeze. Um, credit to, I wanted to give a shout out to Joe Moore, my WCM for, for developing this graphic. And then as you can see, when, when the cold air started to, to build in, we get not only the flash freeze, but also the really strong wind gusts um, as the, the surface load departs the region. So um, this graphic was, you know, really well received and, and a really great depiction of just the, the plethora of hazards that we had to deal with. Uh, speaking of the flash freeze, uh, this was another graphic that we use in our DSS packet. Because, um, you know, and this was uh, something that we made sure to really highlight when we did the, uh, the Minnesota Pathfinder briefing leading up to the event was this was, you know, other than a winter storm, this is, they said this was, you know, one of their, their, the scenarios that they dread because, you know, we had one to two inches of rainfall on the roads and very strong cold air advection and very quickly, uh, rapidly uh, uh, cooling temperatures. So, you know, they could, ideally they would, they would put on, you know, chemical on the road to help uh, inhibit the the ice buildup, but because of the the copious amounts of rainfall, that just wash away. So um, we for this graphic, we use the really the really great infographics from the uh, I believe it's the NWS Communications Office on the flash freeze potential, as well as the um, the forecast sampler tool, which you see to the right, uh, which was uh, developed by uh, Jonathan Wolf, one of our lead forecasters. So you really see temporally just how how much those temperatures really changed, you know, over you know a span of uh, 12 hours, you know, going from lower to middle 40s, all the way down to the teens, just in time for the Thursday morning commute. So to really save time, uh, instead of you know developing a you know another graphic for weather stories to um, or social media that basically say the same thing, we just you know screen captured this. And posted this on Facebook, and it, it turned out to be our top Facebook post in terms of number of shares and reach for this particular event.
which was good to see because you know that um, that Thursday morning commute was 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 pretty nasty. Uh, what else worked well uh, for our uh, side of things? So as we were leading up to the event, we had a uh, a Google Hangout map discussion with our neighbors, especially uh, Chan Hassan and Grand Forks, on collaborating with headlines. You know, instead of you know us uh, kind of going back and forth on the AWIS collaboration chat, this way you know we can have you know a, a very quick conversation about you know what kind of decisions we want to make regarding headlines. On the uh, I think the day before um, we did this, so I had inherited. I worked the day shift. I had inherited a winter weather advisory for the snow across our our western counties, and then we upgraded to a winter storm warning because we had you know the blowing snow the strong winds the, and, and the snow. So the blowing snow reduced visibility. Uh, we actually kind of focused these headlines on not the snow amounts, but the different impacts that they had. So the winter storm warning, we use that for highlighting the, the near whiteout conditions across our west. And then we also issued a winter weather advisory further to the east to highlight the, uh, the, flash, the flash freeze threat. So really focusing on not not like the snowfall amounts uh, for the system, which we usually do, you know, for winter weather advisories and winter storm warnings, but instead focus on the the impacts that they have to travel. Uh, the other thing that we also that also really worked out well was a teamwork approach, uh, utilizing our teleworkers to help build and review the DSS packet uh, from the 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 IDSS builder 2.0. Um, just like I kind of already alluded to earlier. Uh, the DSS packet slides themselves were, you know, kind of took a screen capture and used that for for weather stories and social media content, including uh, using the the slide deck for a Facebook Live. So this was a real big time saver. Instead of kind of, you know, re reinventing the wheel over and over again for our graphics, we basically just, you know, developed the, the DSS packet and used the graphics within it, uh, and and took a screen capture of the slides themselves and use that for our weather story and social media content. So that really saved a lot of time. Uh, one really uh, interesting aspect of this particular storm, as the surface low was lifting off to the northeast, there was potential to break uh, the, the DLH mean sea level pressure record. We were very, very close, but we didn't quite make it. As you can see um, in the observations here, right around 1 a.m. on the morning of December 16th, uh, the, the Duluth ASOS had a, a pressure value of 978.8 millibars. So it just missed tying the record, the record low uh, mean sea level pressure for that particular day by 2.2 by millibars. Uh, wrapping up here for the local impacts, like I kind of already mentioned before, the winter headlines uh, that we had issued, the winter storm warning, and the winter weather advisory were based on impacts and not exactly the snow amounts. Because we really didn't, you know, relative to, to our region, we didn't get a whole lot of snow, only about like one to three inches at the most. But as you can see in the image from a MnDOT uh, plow cam, you know, very treacherous, uh, you know, travel conditions that morning, uh, you know, including near whiteout conditions across our west. This was taken just south of Walker Minnesota, which is right along the um, the you know our border, our CWA border with Grand Forks, and as well as using the the you know the winter weather advisory to highlight that flash freeze threat. Now, although we didn't have a whole lot in terms of severe weather, you know there were uh, there was some tree damage that was reported just south of Hayward, Wisconsin, from strong storms that moved in in the evening of December fifteenth. But otherwise, in terms of of storm damage. That was really about it. Um, the actual, uh, the actual, you know, as the storm lift, lifted to the northeast that night, and then the morning of that Thursday, December 16th, that was when we had a lot more tree damage and power outages due to, you know, the the uh, intensifying winds as the system departed. Okay, wrapping up here. Um, as I was saying, the we had widespread wind gusts of 35 to 45 miles an hour, with some peak gusts to around 45 to 55 miles per hour. And I think the the strongest wind gust was actually right here in Duluth, right here at the the airport, of about 53 miles an hour. 
And another uh, really fascinating aspect is, is uh, at the 12Z December 16th uh, uh, snow and rain observation, you can see the image to the left shows uh, the liquid water within the, the standard rain gauge cylinder. It looks really murky. And we suspect that that was actually dust that was kicked up from the uh, from the, the Great Plains that made it as far north as Duluth, Minnesota. So uh, we had posted that on, on Twitter and that turned out to be our top tweet of the entire event. So um, that I think is the last, uh, last slide for me. So I'll take any questions. All right. Yeah, thank you, Justin. And just like for your office, and we'll go next to lacrosse. I'm going to say that, that that whole issue with the snowpack, and I remember running into that up to this event was how far north could severe weather get with this. So, yeah, great, great job on the talk. All right, we are now going to move to lacrosse with Mike there. Okay. You can see my screen? Yes, I can. All right, great. Well, you're going to hear a lot of uh, similar things that have already been touched on here. We had a lot of similar impacts as our neighboring offices, um, but just want to first thank uh, my partners on this after action review, Jeff and uh, Dan from the office, and also just a, a shout out to our whole office. The, the entire staff provided a lot of helpful perspectives and input for our AAR, so appreciate all that. So wanted to start off by just quick touching on some of the unique, unique impacts that our office had from this event. Uh, as a lot of offices mentioned, the record-breaking warmth, uh, first and foremost, we had 50-plus co-op sites in our area that broke their all-time warmest December temperature reading. And one thing to highlight with, as Minneapolis mentioned, the uh, snow event that we had just about five days prior on December 10th, uh, we had that band of about 8 to 12 inches of snow that moved through the northern part of our area. And that led to some questions for us, forecast questions, as to how is this going to impact our potential instability and the potential for severe weather with having the snow across the north? How, fi how fast is that going to melt away? And how warm are our temperatures going to actually get up there? Well, it turned out, as you can see in this, animation of the snow depth from a period of a few days around this, that uh, with temperatures climbing into the mid 50s in the far north and even down to around 70 in our far south, uh, that snowpack ended up not having a chance and the majority of it all melted away like MPX had mentioned uh, just before this event came to, to pass. And uh, what was interesting was with most of our tornadoes that day, uh, the strongest ones occurred in our far north, which was coincident with where the snowpack had been highest just a few hours before. So that was uh, really remarkable from, from our standpoint here. Uh, we had the most tornadoes like other offices from a single event. This was a new record breaker for us, including our first tornado of December and the same for the state of Minnesota. And the derecho winds that we had reported uh, more than 18 sites of measured 70 mile an hour or stronger gusts in our area, which included more than uh, about eight reports of 80 mile an hour or stronger gusts in our area as well. And our two climate sites in Rochester, Minnesota and La Crosse, Wisconsin, they both reached their second highest wind gusts on record with Rochester hitting theirs twice in the day, once during the severe weather and another during the strong synoptic winds that followed. Uh, unfortunately, we had two fatalities in our area, one from the morning dense fog that MPX touched on. We had the same impacts in the northern parts of our area with all that melting snow. And we also had another fatality during the derecho with a, a tree coming down on an individual during the, the strong part of the storms, unfortunately. Some of the aftermath challenges, a, a lot of the same thing you've heard already, uh, unknown to us at the time, but this quickly turned into our most demanding survey response ever for our office. It took us in total more than one month to complete all the surveying and post-assessment work that was associated with that. Now, a lot of that, of course, was going out and surveying, but of course, we also used the, the satellite 
information that came later, but it was unfortunate because of the cloudy skies due to the time of year, it was tough to get some good passes to really enable us to use the satellite data. And some of the other complications, as MPX mentioned, was we had winter weather that came afterwards, which really compounded the, the difficulties getting out there and surveying with snow. The, the image on the bottom there was a pile up that occurred in our area on I-94 in Wisconsin near Osseo with a freezing drizzle event that uh, led to a lot of slick roads. We actually had one of our survey teams heading out that way that morning. Thankfully, they weren't on the interstate, but even the, the side roads were treacherous for, for them to be able to navigate to get to the areas they needed to survey. And the cold, it's interesting hearing MPX had the same problem with their iPads as us. Uh, the, the batteries just drained rapidly because of the cold temperatures. And another impact with the difficulty as has been touched on was discerning between the wind damage and the tornadic damage. Uh, we had a lot of swaths, as you see here, the light greens with the wind damage, very near to or even coinciding with the tornado tracks. And it was very difficult at times to discern between what was responsible for what with the damage. Uh, there were few tornado debris signatures on the radar to try to help us to hone in on areas of particular interest. And similar, uh, we didn't have crop damage to go by, so that made it more difficult to, to find some signatures. And then with the short daylight hours, this is right, right at right, excuse me, right around the winter solstice. So shortest time, shortest daylight hours of the year. And by the time we travel up to our northern area, we've almost driven about two hours. So there's not a whole lot of time to be able to, to cover a whole lot of ground in one day before it starts getting dark uh, after 4 p.m. and you got to head back. And of course, short staffing, not only because of the holiday leave, but we also still had some. Uh, standing vacancies at our office, so we just had fewer people to draw on to begin with. But our survey teams did an excellent job. We confirmed 27 tornadoes in total from this event, which again was a record for us from any time of the year, but to have that happen in December was just a, a, a crazy thing to, to realize. And we had four EF2 tornadoes, as I mentioned, coinciding with where we had the, the deepest snow depth, just a day or so prior. Some of the best practices, I'm only covering a few here uh, in the interest of time, but uh, probabilistic guidance proved to be invaluable for us to identify this was going to be a significant and what we found out to be this was going to be a historic event. Uh, as that snow event on the 10th wound down, that was when we began to really focus on this particular upcoming system. And just looking at the probabilistic guidance days out, it was clear this was going to be pushing the norms of climatology. And just leading into this event a day or two in advance, it was clear, okay, we're not only pushing the bounds of climatology, we're, we're exceeding it in almost every meteorological parameter here. This is going to be historic. And that gave us a lot of extra confidence to, to use some of those stronger words like historic and dangerous and rare, unprecedented. And those words we, we believe really helped to amplify and ramp up the message that we were getting across to both our partners and, and our other customers as well. Like the other offices that I've mentioned already, we also developed a very clear staffing plan well in advance. The morning of the day shift uh, put that together and gave consideration to who would be fulfilling each individual role based on their individual strengths. And so everybody coming into the office, all the extra help that came in to handle the particular event, right away they knew what was expected of them, they knew what their particular role was going to be, and because they could handle that based especially on their particular strengths, we had very great service that we could offer to our uh, service area that day. And we also found that splitting the forecast and IDSS duties between the typical two forecasters on any given shift leading up to this event and also in the aftermath and the busy days that followed, by splitting the forecast and the, the IDSS duties between forecasters and having just each person focus on that one particular 
side of this event really helped us to have better efficiency and from the IDSS perspective of things, having one person handling the messaging across all the different avenues really gave it better consistency where you don't have so many hands in the pot and uh, individual different styles of messaging where it's just one person and that same message is going out consistently through every avenue that really helped us out a lot. During the event, or just prior, I should say, our warning operators, we had two warning operators who, similar to the other offices, split based on one person handling severes, the other person watching for the spin-ups. Uh, but prior to this event, they quickly reviewed the three ingredients method just to be uh, at their peak and, and ready to go and, and able to recognize it best. And that just in time training really helped them as our Sue, who was who was one of those doing the uh, warning operations that day. Um, he mentioned that it's important for everybody to sharpen the saw and that just in time training really proved valuable to uh, help them. Even the trainer uh, having that opportunity to refresh ahead of time was beneficial. We used uh, the new at that time the new destructive ibw tag for the first time with our severe thunderstorm warnings because it was clear that some of these storms would that line of storms was going to pose a threat for those 80 plus mile an hour winds and what we encountered during our surveys was a lot of success stories from people getting those uh, warnings on their phone ahead of time and getting to shelter because this was such an unusual strong line of storms coming through the area and i'm going to lump myself in that as well i was uh, home during the actual event because i was working midnights but uh that evening as i was watching this storm system coming in the line of storms was approaching and uh, i lost power at our house and we don't have good cell reception uh, without the wi-fi on so i really didn't have any other means at that point of getting warning information um and uh but the phone alerted and uh, I was already planning to go in the basement. So while we were down there, uh, phones alerted for that. So uh, really was a valuable tool in getting that messaging out to people. And like others, we found it was a, a great success to get our event summary webpage published as soon as we could to the web so that that would proactively answer media and other people's questions about the event even even though we could only update it piecemeal in little chunks at a time as the information became realized it was just great to have that already available to people to limit the amount of inquiries that we would have otherwise received and we also had several action items again only highlighting a few of those here in the interest of time but uh, we found that uh, if extra assistance is needed Following these significant events, it's really a great opportunity and idea to try to leverage a less affected neighboring WFO for some extra help. And we did do that in terms of uh, our survey response, having some help from uh, MPX with our cross boundary uh, tornado up there near Stanley. So that was much appreciated and helpful in coordinating with De uh, Des Moines as well. But also considering things such as, you know, could there be maybe room to bring in an extra person for the day or two after when we're handling all the survey effort, or maybe even consider if it's feasible doing partial service backup so that your office could maybe afford to send out another forecaster to help with damage surveys. Uh, one thing that came out of this was uh, the day after, which is always a busy day anyway, in terms of media interest and, and inquiries, we got uh, several inquiries about, is this a derecho? And because a derecho just by definition covers such a large area, a local WFO really isn't in the best place to be able to confirm something of that size and magnitude. And uh, our, I know looking in NWS chat from Des Moines and, and Davenport's area that day, uh, they seem to get even in heightened interest for their areas, was this a derecho or not? And so one thing that we considered going through this after action review is, could that process for confer confirming a derecho, could that be better formalized and maybe reach out, have central region reach out to uh, SPC to maybe 
start discussing that and see if we could perhaps uh, get that in, set in stone so that there aren't this lingering questions in the uh, aftermath, was it a derecho or not? Well, we don't really know. It's outside of our regime here at the local office level. Um, so that's one thing that we would like to see maybe formalized. And another thing from the damage survey perspective is the uh, MRMS rotation tracks. Uh, those, as was conveyed to me, those weren't showing up in the DAT, which I guess they used to. And so that was uh, made it difficult for our survey teams to be able to quickly find where they needed to go because they had to download that data and then put it in there themselves so that they could follow these potential tornado tracks. Um, but those were just some of the action items I wanted to highlight. So thank you very much. And I know we're under time constraints, but that's all I have here. All right. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Great, great presentation here. And yeah, I know we need to move on. And thanks everyone here for holding on. We're down to our final office here for this event. And we're going to pass this along to Ryan up in Marquette. I can see your screen and you're self muted. All right, how about now? Yeah, but your, vo your voice is really quiet. Okay. Better? Well, better. A little better. All right, well, I'll talk loud then. Yeah, that works. Okay, so, uh, yep, thank you, everyone else, and we're going to wrap up. Up here. So, uh, as other folks have talked about already, just the historical context, uh, you know, we were looking as well as at, at the NAFE's uh, historical tools. Uh, and you can see um, just this is, uh, like a six hour, 12 hour forecast of, you know, effectively uh, an analysis uh, how the I mean, sea level pressure was really the, the minimum uh, or below the minimum climatology as the NAFE's mean. You know, uh, low is sub 980 here at 60 on uh, Thursday the 16th, and then at uh, 12 Z, it's, it's even a, a sub 976. So, uh, as others have referenced, this was a really a, a historical and uh, impressive event. Uh, already from five days out, uh, we're looking at just the Euro's uh, EFI and shifted tails for, for wind gusts. And so, this is roughly a five day forecast, but it's the period of 108 to 132 hours out. Uh, and just for wind gust, you can see the, the EFI over a lot of our area exceeding 0.8, we're in that, that 0.8 to 0.9 range. Uh, and the shift of tails, uh, we are getting that, that one contour, at least into to part of the area. So that's an impressive signal for, for five days out. Uh, once we get to approximately the two day forecast, this is now uh, 36 to 60 hours in advance, you can see the significant increase to where the EFI is now greater than 0.9 for uh, effectively all of our CWA, certainly all the, the land part at least. Uh, and there's a, a good area greater than 0.95, even a few dots greater than 0.99. And the shift of tails is now over two for uh, a lot of our area. So there was a, a very strong, very impressive signal for uh, really uh, unusually strong wind gusts uh, with this event uh, well in advance. And so as I was saying, yeah, we have that strong ensemble uh, consensus for you know surface load that was really deeper than anything in the CFSR climo, um, and and all these tools really uh, were able to kind of boost confidence uh, in the the forecast for a few days in advance. As other folks have mentioned, uh, the antecedent conditions were quite different up here than in a lot of the the plains and a lot of the the rest of the region. Uh, we did have a, a pretty decent snowpack still in place. Uh, we had storms both on December 5th and then the December 10th event, uh, which has been referenced a couple times, uh, several inches to, I think, a foot, uh, maybe probably a foot and a half in some places from those two storms combined. And so because of that, you know, the surface-based Cape really kind of struggled to get past central Wisconsin. So it was not really a severe weather event up here. We did have um, thunder really observed, I think, in most areas, you know, at the office, and I know at at Ironwood, which is that, that far western part of Upper Michigan, but but really it was not a severe weather event. Um, so just to, to really kind of hammer that home, you're seeing here, this is on the left, just the, the uh, rapid analysis of surface temp and the right surface base cape. This is 20Z Wednesday the 15th, 
And you'll see uh, there's this horizontal uh, east-west line through roughly center of Wisconsin where the, the temp gradient and therefore at the Cape gradient is, if we advance that four hours to zero Z, that really hasn't budged even as the system overall lifts northeastward. And then another four hours to uh, four Z, you can still see in the left where that temp gradient really hasn't moved and the surface space Cape uh, unit really is just waning diurnally, but um, it's still really struggling to advance uh, northward past that that line because that's where we're getting to the snowpack. You do see a little bit did you know, per the the rap analysis get uh, into far northern Wisconsin into uh, the western upper Michigan, but it was you know considerably less than uh, a lot of other places. Uh, nonetheless, you know strong dynamics did eventually overcome some of the the low level stability, uh, especially with the, the strong cold advection. Um, as the cyclone lifted up northward through our area, it really it developed a quite nice uh, sting jet. And most of the, the strong winds that we observed were with that passage of that sting jet. Um, and uh, strong winds were also just coincident with you know, the, the pressure rise fall uh, couplet and, and where the, the lapse rate steepened you know, naturally. And so, I think this is maybe taking a minute to load my, well, it says audience view 100%. Okay, so this is a, just a satellite loop of uh, channel 10, the low level water vapor. And then I have overlaid the uh, the black contours, the mean sea level pressure, and the, the red dash contours are the 1,850 thickness. And then uh, overlaid as well are all the wind uh, uh, LSRs. So thunderstorm and non-thunderstorm. Uh, there's no wind damage LSRs here. This is just the numeric values. And uh, what you'll see is where, I mean, certainly to the south, just with the, the convective line, there were some impressive wind gusts. But then kind of the, the north edge where that sting jet goes by is uh, also where you get a lot of the, the stronger wind gusts. So I, I'll highlight that here. And you'll see kind of where that sting jet lifts through. And as it plays again, keep an eye on even like southern Minnesota, where a lot of those strong gusts originate right here with the sting jet. And then we have fewer gusts up here. And that's a function of, as uh, other offices have mentioned, just being heavily forested up here. You know, we're not as prone to, to strong synoptic wind gusts. We also just have a much lower population density, so we don't have nearly as many reporting sites. But nonetheless, you'll see uh, early in the morning of the 16th, uh, when that sting jet lifted through western and central upper Michigan is when we do get most of our strongest wind gusts. Although, interestingly enough, the actual strongest wind gust uh, in our CWA was at Standard Rock, Michigan, which is um, currently it shows at 69 miles an hour, uh, but they ended up hitting 77 miles an hour uh, much later in the event, actually several hours uh, after this passage. So that's kind of interesting. I was looking at uh, in the wrap analysis at, at 60 in the, the top left, you're looking at 1,850 thickness injection, so it's the temperature injection, and the top right, the lapse rate, again, the 1,850 layer. And so here at 60, you can see it's still quite stable. Uh, lapse rates are like three, four, five uh, C per kilometer, maybe just a hair above five over far western upper Michigan. Uh, significant pressure falls and you know, a tight gradient. But the important part here is that it is still quite stable. If we advance ahead four hours to now, this is 10 Z. You can see where the system's cold front's coming through, right? A, a patch of really strong cold advection. And that's then steepening the lapse rates. So now the 1850 lapse rate, you're getting up to around eight or nine or even in excess of nine C per kilometer. So it's a, uh, you're getting a, a deeper mixed layer. And then you're certainly, you're, you're right in that area of uh, the uh, pressure fall to, to pressure rise couplet where the, the acetylbaric wind is gonna be enhancing things as well. and so. Sure enough, at this point, uh, this is when we had our 68 mile an hour wind gust at Iron Mountain, uh, which was our second highest uh, land gust of the event, and I believe our third highest overall. Um, and also, I don't know if it was mentioned, I believe uh, Rhinelander had a gust at 76 miles per hour or something uh, shortly before this as well. So uh, through you know, far north central Wisconsin and into uh, much of the UP here early in the morning, the 16th is when we got our, our period of strongest wind. But what's interesting is that the, the really strong winds were actually not all that long lived. Uh, we were prepared for and, and messaging uh, you know, several hours of, of very strong wind gusts. But in reality, what you see then is just four hours later, this is now 14 Z on the 16th. If you're looking at the lapse rate in the top right, the 1,850 lapse rates have come back down into the six to seven, maybe seven and a half C per kilometer range. 
I was just indicating a, a thinner a mixed layer, a thinner boundary layer again. Um, what is interesting though, uh, if you're looking to the bottom right, is that the pressure gradient is shaded, the gradient magnitudes of the, the darker purples are uh, a stronger gradient magnitude. And so you see oriented down the, the western half of Lake Superior where that, that strong gradient is kind of oriented with the, the shape of the lake. That's when we do end up getting our uh, 70 mile per hour wind gust at Houghton, which was the, I believe, the uh, strongest wind gust uh, from land, at least from this event. But outside of that area, the wind gusts actually fell off fairly quickly. So already uh, I was working the midnight shift and at 8 a.m. when I was briefing the, the day shift. So that's a 13Z. I was looking at some of the obs, uh, upstream in, in northern Wisconsin and they were gusts in the, the 30, 35, maybe 40 knot range. And, you know, I was saying to uh, my relief, you know, uh, this is actually not that impressive after we got through that, that main push of just about an hour or two of, of very strong winds. And ultimately, uh, he ended up dropping the high wind warning, uh, converting that to a, a wind advisory uh, within a, a couple hours of, of taking over because the gusts really were not performing uh, after that initial really strong push of, of cold convection. Another way to look at this is uh, if you were to take a, a time height plot, this is at Iron Mountain. So that was the place that got the 68 mile an hour wind gust. Uh, we would read this uh, from left to right. The time that we're interested in, I'm gonna highlight is uh, right here, so that's uh, around 6Z to 15Z on the 16th. And what you're seeing here is just the wind speed shaded in, in those shades of blue where the darker shades are, are stronger winds. And then the potential temperature, just your regular old dry theta and the, the red dash contours. And so right around 9Z, you can see how thick or how deep the, the, uh, the surface mix layer was. But then pretty quickly, you know, another hour or two, it actually uh, comes down quite a bit. So here at like 9Z, 10Z, you're dipping into uh, let's see, uh, it's just about 60 knots at the, the top of that mixed layer, which certainly makes sense because we had that 68 mile an hour wind gust, we were 59 knots, so that, that certainly checks out. But then the uh, thickness of the, the boundary layer, the depth of the boundary layer actually really does decrease again pretty quick. And you can see that where I've just kind of uh, crudely drawn on this yellow line just to show kind of the, the maximum height at the top of, of that mixed layer. And that's it certainly makes sense with what we observed where there was this short period of, of very strong winds with the strongest cold advection. And then even as cold advection continued and even as pressure rises continued and, and the gradient was still fairly tight, we just were not really dipping into the strongest gusts aloft. And it was just in a, being uh, like a one to two, maybe three hour period of very strong winds. And then things really were not uh, all that impressive again after that. As far as uh, the marine messaging goes, you can see the discussion here from uh, Monday morning, the 13th. So this is more than three days out. And we're discussing how, you know, uh, we're already uh, at putting storm force winds uh, into the uh, Lake Superior forecast. Uh, it's been mentioned before, but storm force, anything uh, 48 knots uh, all the way up to the 64 knots. Um, and so for being three days out, this is, you know, a, a really impressive signal. This is, uh, indicates a, a really high confidence of a very strong system. Uh, and I do, uh, we mentioned then in the uh, discussion as well, the potential for a hurricane force gust or two, which is certainly uh, gonna be getting people's attention. Continuing along with the marine messaging, um, once it came time to issue storm watches and then later storm warnings, we were able to tailor not only the additional details, but also the, the uh, PPA, the, the precautionary preparedness actions messaging. Um, so we just uh, were consistently adding in the additional details, this verbiage about how all vessels should remain in port or find safe harbor for tonight and Thursday. Or before that, you know, I think from more than a day out, we were essentially saying all vessels uh, should or all marine interest across Lake Superior should plan to be in the safe harbor, which is a kind of a strong statement for us. And then within, within the PBA here, uh, we had uh, one of our forecasters who's actually the the marine program lead uh, has a maritime background. He uh, was in the, the NOAA Corps for uh, some time. And so he was able to add some marine specific action items that I don't think any of the rest of us would have thought of uh, just you know, being, being land lovers. Uh, but so he goes on to say that, you know, the vessel should continue adding uh, or consider adding extra mooring lines and secure the vessel for severe conditions before conditions deteriorate. 
And so then once he added that in, we were able to carry that uh, message in the PPA over to the next several issuances of the uh, storm warning. Um, and then, again, that's something that I don't think uh, the rest of us would have thought of, uh, but him having a marine background, he was able to, to share that insight with the, the rest of us. So as an action item for further review, uh, you know, we're considering adopting this marine specific PPA language uh, into the default product for storm warnings. Uh, it wouldn't be for gale warnings, but, but for storm warnings for those higher end events, to, you know, do we want to have that uh, come in by default? That's at least something we're going to think about and, and uh, talk about some more. The um, DSS packet that we sent did mention this would be the strongest storm system in years. And so we were messaging that as well. Uh, generally referring back to October of 2017, which is the last time we had really anything of, of this magnitude in uh, the upper Great Lakes. As far as headlines go, uh, we did consider a, a hurricane force wind warning. Uh, and there was some discussion with uh, region as well as some of the neighboring offices if um, a hurricane force wind warning had ever been issued for Lake Superior or really anywhere in the Great Lakes before. Uh, at the time, and to the best of anyone's memory, uh, it didn't appear that there ever had been one issued in the Great Lakes, uh, which is not to say that it may not have verified at other times, but unless we don't believe one had, had ever been issued. Uh, and so we were getting close. We, we had gusts in the forecast that were in the 60, 65 knot range, uh, but ultimately we decided against it because confidence really just wasn't high enough that the hurricane force gust would be significant and widespread. You know, we could see one here, one there, and, and sure enough that uh, on that I mentioned before, Standard Rock and, and Eastern Lake Superior, it hit 77 miles an hour. So that's, uh, you know, over hurricane force, uh, like 65, 66 knots or something like that, but, but just barely. Uh, and that I believe is the only Marine platform that actually did hit hurricane force. And it, it's an elevated, um, platform. I, I don't know offhand the height of it, but it, it's certainly not 10 meters or anything like that. It's it's you know, up there quite high. It's a, a notoriously windy spot. Uh, so there was that consideration. Uh, other considerations were just the workload, having to issue a, a new DSS packet when ultimately that the message hadn't changed, right? The message of being uh, very strong near hurricane force winds, you know, was it worth our, uh, our time to issue an entirely new packet for uh, a message that really hadn't, hadn't changed? Um, and then also, would it make a difference? You know, when we get to a strongly worded storm warning, which we're reporting 55 to 60 knots uh, in the storm warning, and we're mentioning hurricane force gusts uh, to 60, 65, that pretty much is already going to shut down the lake. That's really going to have all the vessels uh, seek safe harbor already. Uh, and I think at that point, if they're not, then I, I don't know that a hurricane force wind warning uh, would make them because there's really not much more you can, you can do at that point if, if they're going to uh, just ignore the, the warning anyway. So for all those reasons, we ended up not going hurricane force, but just continuing the very strongly worded storm warning. Uh, one other interesting point was uh, the possibility of lakeshore flood. So uh, we do have a couple counties that border uh, northern Lake Michigan. And so with a strong southerly wind coming up Lake Michigan, uh, we were anticipating lakeshore flooding. Uh, we had waves that were uh, well into warning criteria for, for us. Um, but ultimately we didn't actually observe any lakeshore flooding. And so that's just one more action item for further reviews to reevaluate the lakeshore flood advisory and, and warning criteria uh, for our Lake Michigan shoreline counties. And so with that, then I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Evan, who's gonna talk about uh, the flash freeze uh, after the wind. Thank you, Ryan, you did a great job. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, just watching for the interest of time. Um, you might just see how fast you can go through. <laughs> I, I'll go as quick as I can. Um, so this was kind of a sneaky winter weather hazard for us. Uh, we didn't really message it going into the event and we didn't really anticipate it, any impacts associated with it uh, afterwards. So props to Duluth and uh, Minneapolis for, for seeing this a little bit better than we did. Um, but overall, we went into this event with a whole bunch of snow on the ground, and we knew that it was going to get warm and moist going through it um, and with, the, with some additional rain. And we thought that that would probably knock the snow back almost down to nothing, which it ended up uh, doing. We had a snow depth of only three inches coming out of this event. But interestingly, there was a, a secondary cold front uh, during the afternoon, and we had about an hour of moderate snow that accompanied that cold front as temperatures fell below freezing. And this resulted in uh, multiple reports from uh, our coworkers and a couple of people from the, from the public who also mentioned that there were flash freeze conditions on area roads. And um, 
just to show you how quick this was, Ryan, can you advance one slide, please? Good. So this, this is a four hour radar loop showing the entirety of the snow event. Um, it, it came in right around, it started just afternoon. It snowed for about an hour and then was out of there before the evening commute and advanced one more. And uh, we, we didn't really message how well that, uh, or how that really light snow event because we had just gone through getting almost 20 inches of snow in places in the two weeks before and less than an inch of snow just is a pretty common phenomenon. We didn't really think much of it going into the event, but um, indeed there, there were flash freeze conditions with this. And it, uh, it kind of leads us to think that um, maybe we should have been uh, issuing a, a flash freeze product or something along those lines. Um, be, because even though we weren't aware of any major impacts, um, we probably should better and find a way to better anticipate and message the next flash freeze event. And that's all I've got.